news, events, sports. Same time, same place, right in the heart of Isla Vista. UCSB TV is serving UC Santa Barbara and the surrounding community with real journalism. UCSB TV, hello and welcome back. This is Alexandra Goldberg and today's newscast you're not going to want to miss. After having one full season canceled and a second season wrought with COVID interruptions, we spoke with players from the UCSB ice hockey team about their first full season since 2020. Up next, a TA labor union had decided to put forth a strike authorization, which means if it passes, there could be a UC system-wide strike for TA wages. But first, a story on fake abortion clinics in Santa Barbara, otherwise known through the provider Network Medical Women's Center, that is deterring patients from getting an abortion. News anchor Rebecca Fairweather has that story. Hello, my name is Rebecca Hortado Fairweather. I'm your news anchor and you're watching UCSB TV. On this week's story, we're covering the dangers of fake abortion clinics that continue to pop up in the surrounding Santa Barbara area and how UCSB students could fall victim to the disingenuous advertisements of Network Medical. CPCs are cleverly designed centers that are specifically made to talk women out of terminating their pregnancy. They are designed to deceive pregnant women through false advertising of their services and when in clinic, talk women out of getting an abortion using fear tactics and guilt. They have purposefully misled women about how pregnant they are or delayed them past the window of opportunity for an abortion. While these centers claim to be helping women get access to reproductive health care, they do little to provide active information or materials to prevent unplanned pregnancy, such as condoms or birth control. I sat down with Julia Taymori, director of UCSB Students for Reproductive Justice, who is currently working on taking one of Network Medical's advertisements down on the UCSB campus. Thank you for joining us today, Julia. Now, can you tell us a little bit about your position at Students for Reproductive Justice? Yeah, so I'm currently the director for SRJ. I've been on the board for three years, um, but this is my first year in the leadership role. As an organization, we're part of AS Human Rights Board, and we are committed to addressing and diminishing structural inequalities regarding reproductive justice at UCSB and beyond. Can you tell us a little bit about what crisis pregnancy centers are and how they operate? Um, yeah, so basically CPCs pre present themselves as re uh, clinics in the area that provide reproductive health care. Um, when they don't do that, they'll often advertise as uh, providing STI testing services or um, even providing ultrasounds to verify the gestational age of a pregnancy when in fact these are not things that they are medically licensed to do. Um, they do not have any doctors on site for the most part and often um, are actually licensed as nonprofits, but they do um, present themselves as medical facilities. So it's really kind of predatory and problematic what they do. Now, what are the dangers that advertisements like this can pose to UCSB students as well as the Santa Barbara community? Oh, well, I mean, they're really predatory in the way that they operate. Students are already such a vulnerable population, um, but some of the dangers um, that they pose are delaying the ability to receive actual care. A lot of the times, one of the tactics that they'll do is um, perform an ultrasound and say that the person who is pregnant is further along than they actually may be, which can impede them from getting actual abortion care. Um, and in addition, they intentionally target a lot of uh, marginalized communities like people of color, black people, and lower income people. So overall, it's just really predatory what they do. What advice would you give to individuals who are looking to go to healthcare clinics on making sure that their place are reputable and safe? Yeah, so there is a really helpful website out there called crisispregnancycentermap.com. I'm pretty sure that's what the URL is. Um, but it points out all the local CPCs in the area. A lot of the time, though, if you happen to find yourself on one of their websites, there, it, there are certain red flags that kind of um, can put identify them as CPCs. A lot of the time this will be comparing themselves to another established facility like Planned Parenthood. It'll be comparing costs, saying that Planned Parenthood steals money when in fact these clinics operate for free. Oh, and another thing that they will do a lot of the time is locate themselves either geographically near existing abortion clinics or in places where abortion clinics used to be. So it really 
does a lot to lure people in, but you can try and protect yourself by knowing some of the language on the websites that we'll use. Like I said, they'll compare themselves, but they also will a lot of the time use terms like unborn or chemical abortion or things that are just super vague and not proper medical terminology. So that's another way to kind of um, protect yourself. How do we as a Santa Barbara community prevent more CPCs from opening and advertising? Honestly, for that, I would say the first thing you can do is make yourself aware of what they are and how they operate. So like like I said, going onto the websites and looking for those red flags, just being aware of what they are. And then from there, kind of doing your part to um, minimize their ability to advertise. So I know recently when I went looking into the local one in the Santa Barbara area, um, it had been flagged on Yelp as a crisis pregnancy center. So doing things like that are some of the first steps we can take to better protect ourselves and the community. Love that. Do you think this will become increasingly popular in liberal areas such as Santa Barbara amid the reversal of Roe v. Wade? I do. I think with a lot of the legislation that has passed in the red states now where abortion is uh, legal, they're going to, or illegal, they're going to focus a lot of their energy on the more liberal states. I know too, um, with the reversal of Roe, California has become somewhat of a sanctuary state for those seeking abortion. Um, and with our clinics already overloaded, as is, a lot of these predatory clinics may pop up to try and um, lure in a greater amount of people um, while the existing reputable facilities are. Um, very overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much for this interview and letting the Santa Barbara community know more. I would just like to ask, is there anything more you'd like to add? Yeah, well, thank you so much for interviewing me. Um, uh, one thing you can do to kind of stay informed and get more information on CPCs is follow our Instagram. It's at SRJUCSB. I know right now our publicity team has been working super hard to publish a campaign of information on CPCs, so definitely something to keep an eye out for. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> that was news anchor Rebecca Fairweather reporting on a fake abortion clinic in Santa Barbara and what that means for the community, especially now after the reversal of Roe v. Wade. Next up, sports reporter Ryan Greenberg spoke with athletes from UCSB Ice Hockey about their first full season since pandemic restrictions were lifted. What's going on, Gauchos? As many of us celebrate COVID beginning to phase itself out of everyday life, college sports are a big beneficiary of the return to normalcy. No team feels more fortunate than our school's ice hockey team. And while many of you might not have even known that we have an ice hockey team, the team is looking forward to the return of college sports at full speed to build a hockey culture at our school. This week, I interviewed members of the ice hockey team to learn about their COVID experiences and how they feel now that it's in the past. Let's have a look. What's going on, Gauchos? This is your sports reporter, Ryan. I'm here with Carter Chasen on the ice hockey team. Introduce yourself. What's up? I'm Carter. Nisei Chitale. Jack Shea. All right, Carter, first question. Where were you in your athletic career in March 2020 when COVID shut down sports? Yeah, so in uh, March 2020, I was actually playing hockey for my high school as well as lacrosse. So uh, it was super fun, super epic to get out there. But uh, unfortunately, 2020 canceled all the seasons, um, stuff like that. So pretty heartbreaking. No more getting pucks deep. Um, and yeah, it was pretty heartbreaking for sure. I just finished my first season with UCSB Ice Hockey, and I was like really looking forward to the second one, but well, then COVID hit. So, you know, couldn't get pucks deep, you know? Uh, my athletic career had definitely taken a downturn at the onset of COVID. I was in community college, and I didn't have an athletic career. So, yeah. All right, for sure. Tell me how COVID affected your hockey career during the pandemic. Oh, I mean, you know, I was looking forward to the next next season, COVID hit, and boom, no no hockey career. Like, definitely COVID shut down all our seasons, so I kind of had to figure out, like, what the like, what am I supposed to do um, throughout, like, an indefinite period at that time. So I actually got really into, like, adventure sports, so I got really into, like, surfing, rock climbing, skiing, stuff like that. Kept me sane, kept me loose, and stuff like that. And, you know, I'd definitely say it helped me, like, now playing hockey, I'm definitely a lot looser, more, more, more mobile, and stuff like that, which is great. Oh, uh, well, yeah, I was definitely hoping to uh – you know, stay in shape over COVID and play a lot of hockey and play in adult leagues. But uh, unfortunately, everything shut down and I wasn't able to and I had to take like a year off playing. So. so tell me how it feels now that COVID is in the rear view mirror and you're able to play hockey without any worrying of hindrances or interruptions. Oh, it's absolutely fantastic. I love playing hockey. I love getting pucks deep with the boys. Uh, we had our first game and it just felt like I was, felt like I just, I had a hit of something. I just wanted more of it, you know, afterwards. Then we had two weeks off, which kind of sucked, but Starting this weekend for the next month, it's just going to be hockey, hockey every single weekend. So pucks deep, lots of sellies, lots of hanging out with the boys. It's going to be awesome.
It's awesome. I'm stoked to be getting pucks deep with the boys again and uh, looking forward to a great season. So now that COVID is in the rearview mirror, describe how it feels to be able to play hockey without worrying about COVID interruptions. Yeah, no, it feels great. Like, it feels epic to be able to have a full season this year, to be able to, you know, come out, see all the fans in the stadium, see the pet band. Uh, it's truly magical out here. Yeah, that's a good segue to my next question. So how does it feel to be able to pack the stands with fans right here? Yeah, I mean, it is, like, unbelievable. It is The energy in this rink is amazing. Um, just been able to get pucks deep, have a fun-ass time out here, and uh, just magical. Man, packing our home games, with, that's, like, some of my favorite hockey ever. Like, I've got a few moments growing up in youth hockey, which is just, like, I look back on it, it's super fun. But nothing is as consistently a good time as playing in, fr in this rink in front of those fans. And it is, it is awesome. We get tons of people here. You get the prep, pep band out here. We got the figure skaters, the whole show. And, you know, every little thing we do, they go crazy. Little hit, little dangle, little snipe, little selly. Uh, pucks deep, like everything. It's so good. Fans are fantastic. Oh, I'm stoked. I'm so ready to, you know, score a goal, a selly in front of the home crowd, get it going a little bit. So looking forward to it. Tell me how it feels knowing that there's going to be playoff hockey for the first time since 2020 this spring. Oh, I'm super, super excited. Like, 2020 is my freshman year, and uh, that was the last time we had playoffs, but I was sick in the hospital, so I missed that. So I've literally never had playoffs hockey at UCSB. So this is going to be one of the best teams we've had since I've been here, and hopefully we can come in. We're a T2 team, so I'm sure they're not really expecting us to get pucks deep as effectively as some of those T1 teams, but I'm hoping we can kind of go in and surprise them. It'll be tons of fun. I'm super stoked. I mean, last year, obviously, playoffs got canceled. We weren't able to go get pucks deep with the boys. We're going to get over there, get the playoffs this year, and uh, hopefully surprise a few teams. So in the end, do you think you came out stronger? Definitely. You know, COVID definitely took a toll on a lot of people, and it definitely took a toll on myself. But um, it, you know, got me interested in a lot of other sports, and it kind of made me a little bit more well-rounded. So. Oh, absolutely. I mean, definitely getting more pucks deep than I was before COVID. So. Well, that's a philosophical question, my guy. I, I don't know. That's a, that's, a, that's a question to ask me in five years, I think. I have no idea. I'm just going. Incredible to see athletes at our school being able to play the sport they cherish without worrying about COVID interruptions. The Gauchos hit the road this weekend playing Cal State Long Beach and Cal State Northridge before their home opener next Saturday. We'll be sure to follow up on our hockey team as well as continue providing all UCSB sports coverage. Thanks for watching. That was sports reporter Ryan Greenberg interviewing UCSB ice hockey and what they have to say about their post-pandemic season. And next up, news reporter Zuri Wilson has the story on a labor union that represents teachers' assistants and how a UC system-wide strike might be brewing for better wages. Henry Yang's raise was 28%. It pushed him over the threshold to half a million dollars. If I got a 28% raise, I would still be rent burdened. We are standing in front of UCSB's graduate division, which is currently facing backlash and strike threats from TAs in the history department who feel as if they are being underpaid and rent burdened. UAW 2865, a labor union that represents all TAs, readers, and tutors across the entire UC system, has been renegotiating its contract with UC Santa Barbara since March and has accused them of participating in unlawful bargaining practices. Because of this, the union has elected to put forward a strike authorization vote that members will need to vote on. Here with me, I have PhD candidate and UAW recording secretary Jenna Hedder here to discuss the strike's inception and its progress. To start off, I just want to ask for you to explain why the strike is occurring and what your role is in the strike efforts. Yeah, so to clarify, we don't actually know that there's going to be a strike yet. Mm -hmm. um, normally, when, when unions are in contract negotiation, there's a couple different ways a strike can happen. The route that we're taking is called the unfair labor practices route if we do wind up going on strike, which we might not. The way an unfair labor practice strike works is that the union charges the university with some violation of labor law, um, which could be anything, direct dealing, failure to bargain in good faith, things of that nature. And um, if the unfair labor practice is egregious enough, while the case makes its way through the court systems, um, the bargaining team is authorized to call a strike authorization vote. What we're bargaining over though, which is a slightly different question, um, mostly pivots around our wages and our housing crisis. And I know that the undergrads are also facing a housing crisis mm -hmm. right now as well. Um, graduate students in the UC system, so statewide, all 10 campuses, are rent burdened, mm -hmm. which is defined by the Department of Housing and Urban Development as if they pay 30% or more of their income 
towards housing and severely rent burdened is 50% or more and about 50% of grad students statewide are severely rent burdened. That's the centerpiece of our bargaining demands is pay us enough to live here. Mm -hmm. And we would love to avoid a strike. Strikes are punishing, they're exhausting, um, and hopefully we can cure unfair labor practices at the table or through the courts and we won't have to go on strike. Okay. Can you kind of describe some of the responsibilities that you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis just to give kind of some context as to the work that you guys do and the unfair pay that you guys are given? So we are contracted to work 20 hours a week. Um, I'm laughing because I don't know anybody who works only yeah. 20 hours a week. We get this thing called a description of duties at the beginning of the term, mm -hmm. and it details for us what our responsibilities for that class are. And they include things like you have to attend lecture, mm -hmm. um, you have to teach section, you have to um, plan your lessons. TAs can pretty much divide up writing the lesson plans, share them, you take your turn one week. Mm -hmm. And that helps with equitable distribution of labor, but that's not always the case. We don't have any say in how much work is assigned in a class. Mm -hmm. It is at the department's discretion to determine what 20 hours is. Mm -hmm. And I have friends who have been told by their professors, just grade faster, just spend only five minutes on an assignment. Wow. That's how you stay under 20 hours. And it's like, so my options are either to go over 20 hours or do a bad job and do a disservice to my students. Mm -hmm. Like those are my choices, mm -hmm. that, that doesn't do me any good, it doesn't do you any good. Yeah. Like that doesn't help. And we often wind up going over our hours because we care what happens to our students. Mm -hmm. Like I've referred students for ADHD screenings, I've helped them get DSP accommodations, I've wow. written letters of rec for um, internships and things like that. It's not in my contract. Mm -hmm. but. I see it as part and parcel of my job mm -hmm. as a TA. Like, yeah. I wouldn't want to do a version of this job mm -hmm. that has me not caring and working only 20 hours. Mm -hmm. What can our viewers do to help support the strike efforts or show solidarity? Is there anything we can do? A thing that happened during the um, COLA Wildcat strikes in 2020 um, was that we often got messages from not faculty, but the administration saying that we were hurting the undergrads mm -hmm. by going on strike, that we were disrupting the undergrads' education, that we were causing problems for them. Um, and it was so funny because we would get these emails and I would like check my email on my phone, look up, and there would be an undergrad standing next to me, like mm -hmm. at a rally. Um, so your support really means a lot. And what's important to keep track of is that our working conditions are very much your learning conditions. Mm -hmm. Like I am going to do a better job as a TA if I've eaten breakfast. I'm going to do a better job as a TA if I don't have to work another 10 hours a week at a side job so that I can make rent, so I have more energy and attention to focus on, on you. Um, so I think just keeping that in mind, that we do better jobs when we can afford to live here, um, is important. And then um, if we do wind up going on strike, which again, we might not, um, when we have our picket lines, if y'all could come by, say hi, mm -hmm. Um, help us do some chants. We love chanting. That would that would also really mean a lot. Mm -hmm. All right. Hello. So, how do you feel about your TAs this quarter? Um, I really like my TAs this quarter. I think they're really involved, and they definitely try to help their students as much as possible. And what kind of things do your TAs do to help you succeed in the classroom and outside of the classroom? Um, my TAs are really supportive. They're available really often, which really helps. And if not, they definitely give me resources like other TA's office hours that I can go through um, for the class. Uh, they also make sure that they kind of stand by after class in case I had any questions that I didn't feel comfortable sharing during class. So they're really supportive and helpful in that aspect. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I'm Zuri Wilson, your UCSB TV news anchor. I'll see you next time. That was news reporter Zuri Wilson with the story on the UC system-wide TA labor union and their upcoming plans to fight for better pay. That's it for now. Thank you for tuning in to this week's newscast, and we'll see you next time. With UCSB-TV, I'm Alexandra Goldberg.